Welcome to 20 Minute Tabletop, a podcast sharing the love of all things tabletop gaming in bite-sized pieces. I'm your host, John Wickey, here today with my co-host, Stevie. These 10 things are the holiday wishes of Stevie and John, and number eight may shock you. Just kidding. This isn't some sort of clickbait nonsense. It's a chance for us to share with you our wish list of new games and accessories that we'd love to play and own in the coming year, and things that are coming out that we're excited for. As the year winds down and we look back at what we love, it's also fun to look forward at what we're hoping for. Let's take a break from our traditional format to talk about 10 things on the 20 Minute Tabletop wish list. So let's just jump right in. We're going to go through our top 10 things. They're not necessarily ranked, but we're going to go through in a list of 10 here to show you what we're most excited for in our wish list. So starting at number one, Flamecraft. You've heard us talk about it on QuestCon, on the favorite things of games and accessories list. So this is obviously high up there. It's something we don't own. So we're hoping to get from Santa. And if not, we'll go and buy it ourselves. But something that we're very, very excited for to own and have all to ourselves. That's what those post-Christmas sales are for, right? Picking up all the games Santa didn't bring you, right? Right? Exactly. Okay, good. So this is a board game where you have a tiny little town with a bunch of shops, and you populate that shops with dragons and use their abilities and slowly move things around, and you work to score to win the game. But in scoring, you also score by helping each other, so you're competitively cooperative to win the game. And it's just got fun art style to it. It's got fun mechanics. It has great replayability. And it was just a lot of fun to play, and so that's why we can't wait to own it and get to play more of it. The second thing on our list is Vassin. Vassin is a Nordic horror TTRPG, and I know, John, you uh, very much have this high on your list, but uh, if you want to talk a little bit more about what you like about it. Yeah, so this is one that I first discovered through the Lost Mountain Saga podcast from Eleanor DiLorenzo with Ann Richmond and Sidney Emanuel playing, and it even became its own official adventure. So it's this spooky Nordic horror game where you're playing through. It's got simpler mechanics. It just it feels like so much fun to play, and it's something different, and the setting of Nordic horror is so really cool. But then they also have extra books such as Mythic Britain and Ireland and other settings that you can play in. And it's just such a fun system. And just listening to that podcast sold me on wanting to have it. And the fact that their adventure then became an official book that you can buy is just so really cool and kind of shows you how quality it is and why it sucked me into wanting to have this myself to play. Yeah, I haven't had the chance to listen to an actual play with this game. I've heard of it through other channels, specifically when I was working through my writing course. Beth the Bard and Jaden King talked about Vassin as a good example of world building. And like you, like there's a lot of horror games out there, but I feel like the specific traditions and myths they're drawing from are very unique. And they're not something necessarily that you see a lot of in the TTRPG space. And like you said, the fact that they are taking things from podcasts and turning them into official adventures is giving you an idea as to the quality of what people are putting out with this system. So yeah, um, given that I like spooky horror games, uh, this is something I'm very excited to play as well as own. You know, I think you touched on it there, that it's, it's different from other types of horror that are out there. Which is what's great, because it gives you something different to play and experience, and in that world building is what's seems so amazing about it. Like I said, don't own it, want to own it. And so that's what it, what has drawn me in. Number three on the list is something that I brought to the table, so to speak, which is Wingspan. I've had the chance to learn how to play this board game via their official app on the iTunes app store. And I absolutely love it. I have heard that the game is equally as gorgeous in person in terms of the art style. It's fairly simple to learn. Obviously, having played it on the app first, the tutorial really walked me through, and I've had a fair amount of experience, but I don't think it's a hard-to-learn game. I know that it has won several awards, and in addition, it's, again, a sneaky educational game because there are bird facts and things like that on all the cards. Yeah, it definitely looks really cool and really interesting, and it's one of those where, like, you've been playing on your iPad, and I've wanted to pick that up to play myself. I just haven't gotten around to it, but I, I think having the physical board game will be a lot of fun to play with. Yeah, one of the things I like about the iPad is the soundtrack is so calming. I've actually um, talked to people who have bought the iPad game and will play it, but also when they're playing the board game at home, will turn the iPad app on just to have the soundtrack in the background because it's so relaxing. 
And it's something that definitely adds to the app. But people are now taking back to the traditional uh, board game as well. And I know they have several expansions out. They have a European expansion and I believe another one either. I think it's something like Asia, Birds of Asia. But yeah, this is a game that I'm really hoping that uh, Santa drops down the chimney because I've absolutely loved playing it on the iPad and would love to play it in person. The fourth item on our list is Starfinder 2E. So we're talking TTRPG. So what this is, is Paizo is creating an updated version of Starfinder to be compatible with the mechanics of Pathfinder 2E. So a little history lesson. Pathfinder 1E came out. It was originally kind of spun off of D&D 3.5 and has a lot of rules based on that, but based on their own on top of that and layered and built out from there. Starfinder was Pathfinder in space, for lack of a better way of doing it, but a whole new set of rules, but built on some of those and kind of was like a step forward on there. And then after that, we got Pathfinder 2E, which was the next step forward. And so what this is going to do is kind of bring Starfinder in a line with the great things of Pathfinder 2E, like the three action economy and some of those things that are really good and that people love and that I personally love about it, that allow you to play Starfinder in there. They've started playtesting some of the classes and some of the things there. So this should come out at some point next year. What I'm excited for is I've wanted to play Starfinder for a while. I own some of the content, but it's, again, it's another system and it's closer akin to Pathfinder 1E than 2E, where there's still a lot of rules and a lot of mechanics you need to learn on how it works and how the turns work, where the three action economy streamlines the learning aspect for people. And with this one being compatible with Pathfinder 2E, I already play Pathfinder 2E with a lot of people. So I have a lot of people will more easily be able to pick up Starfinder 2E to start a Starfinder game to go with it. So I'm really excited for that. Yeah, I'm excited for the new edition of Starfinder because I've been just kind of skimming through some of the playtesting things they've been putting out. And some of the classes seem really fun. Um, And I think that's what I'm most excited about is the character creation. Oh yeah, Starfinder is not wanting for any depth as far as the classes go and for all the ancestries and all the different types of aliens you can be. So I'm also really excited to see all that come forward and convert forward and have all these options because they have done, that is one thing they have done an amazing job of, of it's in space and we're not going to give you any shortage of things for going across the galaxy. So it's really, really cool on that aspect of all that they've made for there and to kind of see that pull forward will be really cool to kind of have that depth to it of what you can be. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love a good role-playing moment, but every once in a while, I also love me a good crunchy set of rolls. Okay, next on our list is Marvel Crisis Protocol. And we were introduced to this game specifically during QuestCon when we saw um, in the Wargaming room lots of people playing it. Uh, TJ took a large interest in it. And it honestly just looks like a lot of fun. And it's a, I feel like it's a good foray into wargaming for our family because it utilizes characters and lore that we're already familiar with from the MCU, but would also give us an idea of what wargaming is like. And it's cool because it's different from some of the other wargaming in that you don't have a whole giant army. You still have... You know, from what I saw, you still have the idea of dice pools and you're rolling a lot of dice to determine how things work out, but you're not playing 100 characters, 50 characters, whatever you play on those larger ones, but you're playing a couple of heroes at once fighting each other with the terrain and the fact that you can buy all the different characters and the different elements to then add into those, I think is really cool. And because it'll be a lot of stuff that can paint, I'm sure Sam is going to absolutely love that and start painting some of those things for us. So there's a lot of different elements to it that I think are really, really cool. And just kind of being able to, like anything, being able to play a superhero is a lot of fun. And so that's kind of one we thought, well, like, this will be a good one for us to try something in that wargaming space that we, we, we aren't familiar with. We haven't played those things. And this one kind of gives us a good step in that I think everyone will enjoy. And, you know, it's kind of fun to kind of just compete against each other and, and see what we can do and, you know, throw a building. We have a Hulk. So the next item on our list is Root. Now, we have, as was mentioned in the Favorite Games and Accessories episode, we have Root RPG. It's one of the ones that Stevie has in a notebook getting ready to play. But what came before Root RPG is a Root board game. And it's that same world of these animal creatures living in this world. And it's just something that I think what looks it looks a lot of fun. I don't know a ton about it, but it just it looks really cool. I love the setting. I love what's come out of there. And so it's one that's on my list of a wish list of I would love to get to to play it and experience and see what it's all about. And let's be honest, the artwork is 
freaking adorable because the same artwork that they use for the board game was used in the RPG. I'm obsessed with all of the official magpie items for Root because it keeps that style of artwork and it's just so stinking cute. Next on our list is Horrified American Monsters. Now, we have talked about Horrified in the past and the first one that came out was the Horrified Universal Monsters. There's also a Greek Monsters version, but specifically American Monsters is about cryptids. Our son has a huge love of cryptids. And so in addition to enjoying the way that the Horrified system plays, being able to play with cryptids, I think, would be uh, a ton of fun. And like I said, there's a huge interest in that with TJ. So I think it's, again, something that we would all enjoy. He loved the Universal Monsters one a lot. And I think being able to delve into the world of specifically American cryptids um, is really neat because they have things like the Jersey Devil and Mothman and things like that that you would think of when you think of cryptids in the U.S. Yeah, this was definitely one of my favorite games from last year, even though it wasn't in the favorite games episode. And I just the mechanics and how you play and what you do and the strategy that goes into it was so much fun. And like I said, getting to include cryptids in there is even more fun. Universal Monsters are also great, but I, I love cryptids I've always had since I was a kid. And TJ being really into them makes it really cool that this is just a great combination to have another version of that game. I think I would have to make a short caveat that we would give an honorable mention in our top 10 to Horrified Greek Monsters because both kids are super into Greek mythology right now. I have learned more about Greek mythology in the last year than I ever have in my entire life. So I think that would also be enjoyable, but right now that's not something that, in terms of monsters, TJ's super into. Like I said, the the cryptids for you and TJ is much higher uh, on the list, but I would definitely give an honorable shout out, an honorable mention to horrified uh, Greek monsters. So we'll, just, we'll call that 7B. The eighth item on our wish list is, well, if you follow us, no surprise, more Lorcana. It's one of our favorite games. TJ and I play it almost every night. Yeah, I'm really excited for more cards, but also the wish list, just more availability. It's one of the struggles that's been, especially in the first release, was availability to get booster packs and get starter decks. We managed to get starter decks. We didn't get any booster packs until this past weekend when we went to the collective, and we're finally able to get some booster packs there. It's been a struggle. There's been scalper issues, but honestly, the game is amazing, and they're working to work that all out, and there's been reprints of the first version, so I'm really excited for more of these cards to come out and continue to grow our decks and have new and interesting characters. If you want to know more about Lakana, you can check out episode 13, where we did a look at it right after the first version release with our starter decks. Now, number nine should be no surprise to anyone in the gaming space, especially if you're into TTRPGs. Item number nine is more dice. You can always use more dice, honestly. But I know that there are some dice makers we don't own sets from that are on our list. Personally, I would love to own a chonk from uh, Smoking Glue Guns, or as Sam calls it, Smoking Hot Glue Guns. And I know Whitney loves uh, when I call her that, so hey. But I know that you have some dice makers high on your list as well. Oh, yeah. One maker I have my eyes set on specifically is Arcane Fake Creation. They make some beautiful dice. It's one that I haven't pulled the trigger on buying yet. We've seen them at some of the cons, and I think probably the next time we see them, I will end up buying one of their sets. They're just beautiful dice, really great creations that they have there. Some of the other bigger brands that you might know about is Dispel Dice. Some of their dice are always really cool. They're always coming out with great new ones. They're one of your larger dice makers. And Norse Foundry, which makes some really cool aluminum dice that I have a D20 from them from the Glass Cannon podcast from GCP, one of their D20s, and it's really fun. I would love to have like a nice metal set from them. The aluminum is just, it's metal aluminum. It's just so cool and interesting and different, and that's what I love about that. So I love, I love some of the big creators like Dispel Dice who go and are always coming out with new ones, but I also love the handcrafted sets like Arcane Fake Creations and Roll With Adventure that I bought at QuestCon. Just those handcrafted ones are just also always so unique, which also I love. I definitely think Roll for Adventure is on my list because their liquid core dice are gorgeous. And as soon as they hear this, I'm sure that um, they're going to contact me. But I would love to get a custom set from Chaos Pixie Magic because they pour custom sets all the time. I would love to get like a 20-minute tabletop themed or a more core themed dice set from uh, that store. 
Um, and I'm sure Caitlin's going to be like, you just need to ask um, when, as soon as she hears this. And Norse Foundry is also on my list. I haven't gotten to roll them in person. So I'm looking forward to that when we go to PAX Unplugged. But I'm sure I'll fall in love with them. Another set of dice that I really enjoyed was from Crit or Die. They're metal dice that like jingle when you roll them were some of the most unique dice I've ever seen. So those are definitely on a wish list for one day because I would want sort of the perfect metal color. But the fact that they jingle when you roll them is really neat and actually kind of seasonal. Like I feel it'd be really fun to play a hometown holiday with those. I think it'd be really fun to get just a set of like just the D6, not a full die set, but like multiple D6. So when you roll a bunch of D6 at once, you get a lot of jingling going on at once. It'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I definitely think that would be uh, super thematic too. Like if we were to play Hometown Holiday in person, get a bunch of jingling dice. I think that would be a, a good time right there. And the 10th item on our list is no surprise to me. So I'll toss it over to you, Stevie. More notebooks. We have a large list of RPGs we want to play next year, and I don't have enough places to keep all those notes because you can't keep them in the same notebook. You get all mixed up. So yeah, I definitely have more notebooks on my wish list. I've mentioned in the past um, that I absolutely adore Scribbles That Matter notebooks. There are some other large companies whose notebooks I also use, like Lectrum. But one of these smaller companies whose notebooks I really enjoy is called Notebook Therapy. She makes dot grid notebooks. They are gorgeous quality, and the designs on them are very unique. So the our home Pathfinder game, I'm playing a kit soon, so I got a notebook therapy notebook that has a fox on it, which I thought was a fun way to help me remember, oh, that's what this notebook is for. But yes, I can always use more notebooks. The other ones that I like are the blank A5 notebooks from Moxie Life. They're nice and small and thin. Paper quality is good. So they're good for like one shots or short campaigns. And they have them in literally a rainbow of colors. And I have those, goodness knows, all over the house because that's currently what I dump my story ideas into for writing my next adventure. I'll throw out there, you know, as much as I make fun of you for this, though, I definitely could would love to get one of the inserts for... Pathfinder 2E, because when I bought my Rook and the Raven, I bought one of the 1E one because they didn't have a 2E GM version yet at that point. So I'd love to get some of the more specific inserts to what we do play a little bit more of, but also just more of their campaign builder stuff because they're so cool. And I know as I dig into it, I'm going to start using up all those pages real quick when I start building stuff out. So I know I'm going to get some more ahead of time to just preemptively be ready for what I know will be coming. Uh, do you want to give any honorable mentions for the top 10 list? I will throw out there, uh, too, one on the wish list is something I have already pre-ordered, is Deathmatch Island from Evil Hat. It looks really cool, which is hence why I pre-ordered it. They had a Kickstarter for it, and I love Evil Hat in general. So the idea is you are on this island that is a game show that you need to survive, and you don't really know why or what's going on, so a lot of it uncovers that as you're going through. It just looks like so much fun. I trust Evil Hat in that I like the style of stuff that they build, so I'm very, very excited for that one. Yeah, that's definitely come across my dashboard and piqued my interest because it seems like it's almost like a cross between Survivor and Squid Game in that, like you said, you're on an island, there's some sort of game show going on, but you don't really know what's happening. And to me, that sounds like, A, a lot of fun, that it can be episodic like Blades in the Dark is, but also that similar to Brindlewood Bay or other episodic games that I cannot think of the name of right now. There's also like a longer, deeper B storyline going on that kind of the threads of that are woven through the story. Like you said, there's something larger going on that they hint at. And I always like things that have layers. I mean, and it was great because I was looking at it, considering it, whether I wanted to get it. And you're like, have you seen this game? And I'm like, yes, I have. Order. That's true. I did send it to you and you were like, oh, it's, it's, I've already pre-ordered it. So we're in good shape. Another one I'll throw out there is something that I, I kind of found when I was just looking around to see what kind of other games are out there. And just in general, like I like to browse is a game called Star Wars Outer Rim. It's a strategy game where you get to play as a scoundrel. So a smuggler, a mercenary, a bounty hunter, and you're looking to build your fame. So you can play as Han Solo, Orlando, Boba Fett, 
and they even have an expansion out for it. So it just looks like this really cool strategy game in space in the Star Wars universe. You get to be those characters, which is just a lot of fun when you can embody a character that you love and enjoy. And I love strategy games, and I kind of like those extra bits here. So it just it looks really, really interesting to me. I have dibs on Boba Fett. I, I figured as much. I'm just saying. Another honorable mention would basically be any Flux game we don't own already. That is such a go-to in our house when uh, the kids want to play a quick game before bed, when it's after screens off, but before actual like get in bed and get ready for bedtime. We tend to, to favor short games in that time period. And yeah, every version of Flux in existence. I know TJ specifically wants the Doctor Who Flux. Hopefully he'll get lucky and Santa will bring that for him. You, you say short game, but those games don't always last so short when the rules get crazy. I also feel like the more people are playing, the longer the game takes, but that is, again, different ball of whack. So, you've heard our list, even with some honorable mentions. What's on your wish list? I would love to take our wish list of 10 and make it a wish list of 20 any day of the week. So, what's on your wish list? What should we look at? And what should we be excited for? We could easily make it a wish list of 30 or 40 or 50 if we're being honest here. So, I'm John Wiki, and you can find me on threads and Instagram as John underscore Wiki underscore games. That's W-I-C-K-E-E. And I'm Stevie, and you can find me on social media at Stevie's underscore games. Twenty Minute Tabletop is a Morecore Studios production. Theme song by Arthur Rowan, Morecore Art by Cedar Duncan. Do you want more tabletop gaming fun? Subscribe to 20 Minute Tabletop on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Like what you hear? Leave us a review while you're there or tell a friend. Find out more on our website, 20minutetabletop.com. That's the numbers 20mintabletop.com. Or connect with us on Twitter, threads, and Instagram as at 20mintabletop. At 20mintabletop. Thank you and roll with fortune. What are they called? I'm going to forget now. My brain just forgot on me. That's why I was adding in there, figuring maybe that vamping would help you find it while you were thinking. Vamp, 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 vamp. I'm a minister. I'm an entertainer. I'm a ministainer. It's Joey when he's doing Monica and Chandler's wedding, and they have to delay to find Chandler. Uh, It's never going to come back to me now.